energizes creative possibilities. Uh, the fact that, you know, the fact that you as a creative being, not just you as a creative being, but you can, you know, you can explore creativity. You can explore certain uh, frozen areas, maybe, of expression, frozen areas of languages within you, and you can, uh, and you can create loops of, of energy. So it, is also, it also works as a kind of cultural ecology. And so uh, unleashing energy. So then I think that is a very important aspect of translation today. And of course, there is the virtual world where you're constantly translating. You're translating not just languages, but you're, you know, mentally, but you're also translating maybe emojis, you're translating um, pictures, you're translating. So it's, it's also what is called intersemiotic translation, you know, translating from one sign to the other. And of course, uh, interlingual translation as well. Am I audible? Am I speaking fast? Is it all right? Or should I speak slowly? It's all good, madam. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine? Okay. Yes. Clearly audible. No issues. Clearly audible. OK, thanks. Uh, one thing before I really, uh, before I, I move forward, and that is I was just talking about the virtual world. And I think the virtual world um, has also increased a certain tendency in the world which was there not just a tendency but a reality and that was a one-way traffic the one-way traffic in the sense that there was always a translation from i mean into english so from from other languages so we were all you know going in one direction and you know that one-way traffics are never healthy so uh, you know you need to you need to have traffic in all directions and i think it is important Mm, for all of you, it is important for all of us who are in translation studies to prevent this one-way traffic and to see how we can enable translation, uh, uh, you know, how we can enable translation to move out in different directions. And uh, of course, so the, you know, to, to translate from as many languages into as many uh, less translated languages as well, to, to, to translate from as many less translated languages into as many less translated languages as possible. So with those words, I think I will move towards uh, my, my, my presentation. And, uh, and I, will, I, I, will, uh, I will try to share a PowerPoint, share a screen, just, just a minute, sorry. Yes. Uh, Uh, so uh, this is, you know, I'm going to talk about aspects of translation studies. Am I audible? Hello? Hello? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. You are audible. Yeah. Please go yeah, ahead. Okay. Fine. Uh, well, so uh, something is going wrong with my, uh, uh, while I'm... I, I mute myself and while unmuting, it's going problem. So you go on, madam, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, you can also see my screen. Can you see my screen? No, madam. Yes, yes. Huh? yes. You can see my screen, Jatin? Yes, of course. I can. Oh, okay. Okay. No, ma'am, we can see you, but uh, not the not screen. Not the screen. Okay, so, sorry. So just should I try again? Just let me try. This is, I think it's important that you see the screen as well. Uh, okay, the screen we can't see. But, uh, okay, so I will just try. Just bear with me a moment. I will just try again. Okay, so let me try to share screen. Sorry, just a minute. I the share screen button. Um, 
sorry where is the share screen button can someone help please madam there is a present now at the bottom there yeah yeah there yeah sorry yes click on that madam yes your entire you... screen yeah your yeah, entire screen yes. Yes, yes okay can you see now uh, uh, not yet not yet uh, not yet Yeah, no. Sorry, just bear with me a little. Can you see? No. No. Now we'll probably be able to see. Yes. Yeah. It's visible now, ma'am. Yes, it's visible, but it hasn't yet come, right? And no, it hasn't. Yes, it's visible now. It's visible now. Yes, madam. Okay. So, um, so we have these uh, aspects of translation studies, uh, process oriented. I mean, we are trying to talk about translation studies and trying to see how. Uh, the, the factors involved in uh, translation studies, and uh, so uh, I think uh, this is an, uh, a somewhat arbitrary division, but nevertheless it helps in approaching translation studies to to an extent. So you have uh, this uh, process oriented, uh, product oriented, and function oriented, and uh, I will uh, move towards the. Function oriented first because uh, you know that relates to cultural studies and that also relates to uh, certain certain issues and uh, and perhaps I'm I'm also uh, more involved in this part of translation studies than in those other two parts. Although I think that the function oriented is also uh, linked with the product oriented. So actually, function oriented relates to translation history. Which means which books were translated, where, by whom, how, and also the, uh, the 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 influence that the translated books had on the cultural scenario of the target culture. So uh, this is uh, you know this is what I'm trying to to. Uh, so I, this will be the first part of my talk, and here I will I'm trying to show you that. Uh, there are certain received notions with reference to the history of translation, and somehow these, and sometimes these received, we have to go beyond these received notions. And if we really go deep into the history of translation, we see that uh, sometimes received attentions, uh, received assumptions, need to be questioned. So uh, you know, several translation scholars feel that. The, the the early period uh, in the early period uh, we did not have translation translation as we know it today came to us uh, after we uh, after the the emergence of print so it was with print culture that we had translation there are other scholars who think otherwise and uh, so they feel that you know it was the they feel that the medieval period for instance was a golden age of translation and uh, translations opened up a certain space for dialogue between the authoritative tradition of sanskrit linked with brahmanical power and hierarchy and the people uh, but also uh, you know, this was also uh, during the 17th and 18th centuries, there were translations and retellings of Arabic, Persian, and Hindi narratives, along with Sanskrit texts, as a part of religious encounters taking place between communities during the period. 
and uh, it has been uh, demonstrated by scholars, by uh, Tony K. Stewart, who works in this area, that this search for equivalence in the encounter of religions, where each tries to make oneself understood in a language not one's own, may be comprehended through the translation models that are at the same time literal, refractive, dynamic, and metaphoric. And what is more important is that that lead to complex realms of conceptual sharing. So actually, a uh, study of translations during this period would lead us to, to, to see how one enters these realms of conceptual sharing. And then uh, the third factor in this, in the, of, of translation history in the early period, is that translation during that period played an important role in the formation of a public culture that had multiple interwoven strands of folk and religious cults. So, so that is what our public culture is uh, made of, multiple interwoven strands of folk and religious cults, along with different kinds of storytelling and performative patterns. So uh, these, I would say, these fall within the realm of translation studies. And uh, then uh, we have not, we have not really, uh, we, we have a few scholars who have looked at uh, the whole of translational history in India, but we have a few and we have, you know, for instance, uh, Prabal Dashgupta, who he is not just talking about the Indian context, but it, it is applicable to the Indian context is that one encounters a kind of missionary paradigm in the early phase of translational history. Missionary does not here mean just religion, but missionary means also knowledge. Knowledge that is, um, you know, knowledge that one feels one needs to acquire. Uh, knowledge that is sometimes also imposed, but also, you know, there is a restrictive category. There's a restrictive field of choice from which one takes. And one takes in accordance with one's, with one's uh, with, I mean, with one's needs and uh, immediate needs. There is, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a constructive fist paradigm. He calls it, and there one gradually moves on to a substantivist paradigm, which is where one is, uh, you know, one has a broader choice. Uh, one can choose from the, you know, one links translational practices with the material conditions of life. And uh, you know, and one moves forward. But what I, but what I feel is that it is there. There are multiple ways in reading this history, and this history can also yield multiple meanings. And I will just touch upon one small note uh, of, uh, I mean, one one particular line in this translation history, and uh, that is the the uh, you know the. Uh, the fact that in our translation history, we have again and again a kind of a reinstatement of a plurilingual world, of a, of a, of a, of a multilingual culture. And this is evidenced right from the very first, uh, you know, very second text uh, that, that was translated uh, after the appearance of print. And these were three legal regulations. And it must be mentioned that the uh, plurilingual situation in India led to a kind of multilingual court vocabulary. This was there in the first three legal uh, regulations too. There were, there were a mix of different words from different languages. And so with a large amount of code switching and the tradition has continued in translation of legal documents to this day. So, but then, and then moving on, we see that translation, uh, this uh, multilingual, multicultural element within translation was evident all through. And uh, so it was, it had, it had multiple overlaps, uh, yeah, uh, indicative of a robust energy. There was a strong assimilative impulse and names of texts were often interchanged. For instance, Kito Pradesh was translated several times in the early period, and uh, and then uh, Hito Pradesh, a text in Sanskrit, was translated into Bangla. Uh, there were three different uh, translations in the course of about uh, four or five, uh, sorry, six years. 
but Hitopadesh was also the name of a collection of translation of Ishop's tales brought out by the School Book Society. So, you know, this is, uh, there, there was no hes hesitation in having the same name for a book, uh, for a, a collection of translation of tales from a very different culture. And then we've always had this in our, in our, in our system that a translator often uh, translates core cultural texts from two different cultures, uh, demonstrating an easy journey between cultures. For example, we have uh, Tarashankar Karkaratno, who translated Banabhatta's prose romance Kadambari and Samuel Johnson's Rasselas. Now, both are important texts in their own uh, cultural traditions. And, and uh, Tarashankar uh, does not have, you know, he's, he's equally at home in both. Uh, so he, he, he's affiliated, as it were, to both. Uh, to both cultures, or there is an, as I said, there's an easy journey between cultures. And also, uh, if you look at the history of translation, a particular, uh, you know, often uh, we see that both Megadutam and Rubat are two of the most translated texts in Bangla. And uh, uh, with that, I think, uh, yes, and also before uh, moving out of this uh, phase, uh, uh, I, I would like to uh, state that often, as I said before, that often if you look at translation history, it, it leads to the questioning of assumed norms. Uh, for instance, uh, there was this vernacular literature committee established by British and Indian scholars, which was actually a, a society for the translation of, of text in Bengal. And in the preface to the first text published by this society, which was called Lord Clive, the translator wrote that the object of the association is distinctly stated to be not only to translate, but to adapt English authors into Bengali. <coughs> Sorry, the colonialist project aimed at obliterating elements in the literary system. <coughs> Sorry. And that was only partially successful because the society produced texts from many languages <laughs> and not only from English. <coughs> so I think I will move on. <coughs> uh, there are also, you know, you, you see that it leads to <coughs> to avoid changes in knowledge systems. If you read uh, you know, I, I saw a work being undertaken on, on the medical literature related to madness. And like Foucault's Madness and Civilization, we also see there how, you know, madness receives a very rigid form. Uh, how madness is, you know, how what is normal receives a very, very, very rigid structure. Similarly, certain other issues like, you know, uh, a lot of texts on midwifery were translated, and those obliterate, you know, and those sort of serve to erase certain, <clears throat> I mean, the the the, the um, knowledge systems that one had <clears throat> in the country related to midwifery. And so there was uh, here, you know, there was no question of coexistence in these cases. So that is one part. I will now move over to another part, and that is look at the process. Now, this is, these are, I'm not very, uh, well, I'm, I'm not very comfortable, should I say, with these structures, but they're helpful. Comfortable because I find them a little rigid, but they do, do take up issues that may be, uh, that may be useful. And they also give you an overall picture. <laughs> You know, translation, I think, is a more fluid process. But uh, for, for uh, practitioners and for those who are approaching translation studies, maybe one needs uh, certain tools, and these tools perhaps help. Uh, this is, a, uh, the, uh, you know, I'm, I have uh, actually taken this from a Bengali scholar, but who has, again, taken this from other, other sources, but who has sort of transform them, and I too have transformed some of it, uh, parts of it. So you have the source language and the target language. 
So you have a text where what matters is the writing and what matters is the style. And the style is that of the authors. And behind the author, you have a history of literature. You have a style of the school to which he belongs. You have his mental makeup. And you have the purpose, uh, his purpose in writing. And uh, similarly, in the target language, you have the translate, you have the writing, but you also have the reading of on the part of the translator, and you have the translator's style. There too, you have history of literature, you have the style of the school, and you have various areas of reception. Reception uh, in the context of time, in the context of place, in the context of culture, and in the context of the individual. And also you have a purpose of translation. Uh, on the translator's part. Then you have uh, on this uh, part of the source language, you have the history of language, you have the style of the genre, you have a worldview, you have literary ideals, all these of the authors of the source, the, that is of this, the, the source language text. And whereas in the target language, you again have history of language, you have genre style, you have reception, and you have worldview, and you have the literary ideal of the translator. So, and then you have, to come back to source language, you have structure of language, you have period style, you have social position of the writer, and then here you have the structure of language. You have, uh, you have the period style, you have reception, and then you have uh, the, uh, the translator's individual uh, uh, preferences. And, uh, if, you know, with relation to genre, I think it should be noted that even within literature, you have different, I mean, there, there has to be, uh, or, well, there are uh, different approaches to the translation of poems, different approaches to the translation of fiction, different approaches of novels and of short stories and different approaches to the translation of place. But I'm not entering to that question here. That is also not a part of this uh, issue, these issues related to the process. So it's a, so it's a, the transformation in itself is a complex process. And it has all this, all this behind, uh, behind the very act. I mean, the, there is this entire process taking place in the very act of translation. And uh, however, you know, this is uh, <clears throat> this was uh, say in the in the perhaps in the last decades of the 20th century, um, the 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 framework is still valid today. But uh, this is but there are a certain cert, a few factors that we perhaps need to underline, and that is uh, the complexity of intercultural translation that involves more than the author and the translator. So it is not just a question of the source language author and the target language translator. You have a reader, of course, reader's role is included in reception, but maybe uh, certain other factors may be there. The intermediaries, you know, maybe you know, uh, the role of uh, intermediaries and events, prizes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, editors, publishers, etc. But also the very notion of the text. The, the notion of the text today has become rather fluid, and within the text, there are there is a there are uh, you know the, the text itself has this kind uh, a kind of dialogic intertextuality. I mean, you can only translate because you have that dialogic intertextuality within the text itself. Uh, so that changes uh, the fact, you know, certain uh, traditional oppositions or binarisms like fidelity, inaccuracy, source, target, transparency, obesity, etc. And what we have today is gradually a more complex point of view, which is, you know, which which is which is which evolves, which is gradual and which is nuanced. And one includes today rewriting recreation, contribution to literature, etc., within legal, social, and historical constraints. And then now I will move on to, uh, in, uh, maybe this is a part of the process, but here one is looking at uh, the kinds of texts and what happens in each case. And the kinds of texts are divided 
in accordance with language functions <clears throat> this 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 uh, uh, is taken from but again you know reworked from uh, partially reproduced from peter newmark's approaches to translation and newmark is working with buller's language functions but actually later you know there there is uh, uh, there is this uh, text by uh, roman jacobson who has uh, six approaches to an act of communication or rather six elements to an act of communication and that takes and that takes care of several other functions however there is no schema which probably i don't know maybe there is but um, that that could have other nuances however this again is as i say that you know this is uh, there is you cannot have the final word in where translation is concerned and this is also somewhat rigid but then it gives you an you know it gives you an insight into what is happening in the course of translation i mean translating uh, so what so you have examples so you have the the, the texts are divided into three uh, categories one is expressive the second is informative and the third is vocative vocative that is where you are addressing directly addressing the reader or the uh, yes the, the reader <coughs> so uh, you have in the expressive you have literature uh, you have scientific uh, in the informative you have scientific texts you have technical texts and in the vocative you have notices you have laws uh, publicity maybe you can have advertisements uh, propaganda literature all of all kinds of things so where you are trying to persuade so uh, the ideal style uh this is the in the expressive for uh, in the expressive section it is the individual in the informative section it is neutral and objective in the vocative section it is persuasive and imperative and uh, method here the method is literal translation now literal translation is uh, translation where you are trying to um you know uh, you're where, where you're actually trying to to render as closely as possible as the other language allows the contextual uh, meaning and the experience of the original so which means that you have uh, to, to 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 get the meaning and the experience across you're actually looking at syntax you're looking at word order you're looking at rhythm you are looking at sound you know so syntax word order rhythm sound all these have uh, all these have semantic values so this is what is meant by literal translation and in the informative section uh, you have equivalent effect translation that is you are you are aspiring towards the same effect equivalent effect translation and in the vocative context it's equivalent effect recreation that is you are you can use whatever you know other means to get the same uh, to to get the same effect so in the in the context of the information in the context of text uh, etc etc you there is this equivalent effect translation and in the case of uh, notices laws etc it's equivalent effect recreation and uh, text emphasis in the expressive context is the source language in the informative context is the target language and in the vocative context too it is the target language the focus in the context of the expressive is figurative in the case of the informative it is factual and in the case of the vocative it is compelling uh although the unit of translation is word what i would like to uh, uh to to state is also that you know you are uh, you are never really focusing on a word you are actually focusing uh, you have to focus on the word i mean words are important in in literature but in Uh, eventually it is the general tone that matters in any translation i think and uh, and also uh, i remember this you know because i remember um, 
maybe it was Leela Rai, who was uh, who was uh, you know who was uh, talking to someone about translation. Who she was responding to someone who asked her about something, and she says, "No, never look at dictionaries while translating, because dictionaries will lead you to words." Uh, which are dead, and while you are translating, you need to work with a living language. Similarly, you know, uh, Rabindranath, I remember, was uh, you know has stated at one point that if one fails to translate well, it is because one is not one is afraid of using the colloquial language. So these are some of the factors there. But but on the other hand, this unit of translation. I mean, and they are they're, she is careful to write the the minimum unit of translation is it would be word and then so and then you have keywords. So for the exp in expressive literature, you have like motives, stylistic markers, and uh, keywords. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, all right, and then in the informative section, you have theme words, and in the vocative uh, section, you have token words. Token words in the sense that, you know, you may have for advertisements, you may have uh, for the advertisement of cars, etc. I mean, you use whatever word is in fashion at that point of time with the young generation. For the advertisement of, uh, say, for instance, of of perfume, maybe you are use you might use some uh, a French word. Uh, so this is these are these are token words. Theme words, for instance, say you are translate you are you are you are uh, translating a text that relates to uh, globalization, and you have a have a word called planetarity. So you are you can, you are not using. So you have to keep on repeating the uh, you will. Use the word planetarity uh, throughout, uh, because that is the theme on which that particular uh, essay uh, is centered. Uh, where light motives, etc., are concerned, you know, I remember the, uh, the you know, this is uh, from the history of Bible translation. I remember that uh, the Bible translation. I mean, it's 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 interesting Bible translation and what was happening there. That is also something that we need to look at more carefully. And there you find that uh, uh, the uh, you know there you find that uh, that certain words there was they had a meeting. See, in the early stages of Bible translation, I don't know about the case in. Uh, in, in Oriya, but I think it will it would it, it will be more or less the same. But in Bengal, what happened in Bangla? What happened was that the translations that that were produced from right from 1800 even earlier uh, to till about 1832, uh, you know, in the different editions, there were probably eight editions. You know, the the syntax was absolutely foreign. And uh, it, one couldn't read it. It, uh, it was. It, it used to be very jarring. Now the prose had not not really uh, gained the kind of fluidity that that was necessary to translate. And there was, and they were using a lot of literal translate. I mean, they were taking recourse to literal translation. And then there was a meeting. I think this meeting was held in, uh, in the Baptist. Uh, well, in, in the, there was a meeting in um, in 181865, uh, and there one sees that you know it is advocated that certain words be retained. And for instance, for instance, or you know, for instance, uh, when they are saying. You know, I am the alpha and the omega. So in Bangla, you know, they are asking you not to translate the words alpha and omega. They are saying ami alpha are omega. And then in that, in that, uh, so and then again in another context, they are saying that you should retain the word nabi for prophet, because the Bengali word bhavishyat bhakta, or one who can talk about the future. It was you know cannot be used because it is not connotative enough. 
but the word nabi is connotative and so use the word for so for prophet use the word connotation uh, the use the word that that is more connotative uh, so these are some of the things that enter that 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 one needs to remember in uh, while translating literature i would also like to men mention this since i'm talking about the bible translation that there were better results in free translations in after a certain period after 1832 maybe or still later as uh, you know there is a for instance uh, there were the in a in a version of a translation of the psalms there were a number of of persian words and that really went well with the readers and they were and of uh, and you know when they were translating solomon songs into bangla there there is an 1878 translation where this where solomon songs are rendered in a panchali form and uh, and and that was really effective so this is uh, this is again uh, important so to to come back to this so you have where you have unusual metaphors in the context of literature you reproduce them in the context of informative texts it's enough if you give the sense and in the context of the vocative you know for probably one can recreate uh i am not going into this uh the fact that you know literal translation and uh, how uh, uh versus uh, other kinds of translations because translation as uh, is uh, this is you know this is uh, the uh one is not really thinking in terms of in terms of uh, the exact you know reproducing the exact contextual meaning of the original that is also not possible and uh, sometimes technically accurate translators uh, translations really have nothing to contribute to the literary world and if they do not have anything to contribute to the literary world uh, and nobody reads them then they fail as uh, the you know they fail to communicate so there is there has to be a process a kind of a well there, there has to be a new space this is nothing new this is something that had been talked about earlier as well and uh, but the the this the, the you know there is a nuance there are nuanced thoughts related to this new space and where which can be a space also of mutual exchange uh, and which can lead to the enrichment of both uh, source language and target language texts and uh, so uh, also uh, texts we talked about the expressive the informative and the vocative but texts a single text may incorporate these different functions so the whole uh, the whole context of translations and issues and they have undergone changes they have undergone but sometimes radical changes but then there are certain uh, you know uh, but then again they, they 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 are important to sort of um, to orient uh, translation activity in in some uh, certain contexts uh, so translation one one actually uh, envisions translation today as leading to a growing network within the communication system and i particularly like this uh, this phrasing that it's a significant set of meanings that refers to another set of meanings through phases of enrichment and progressive development so significant set of meanings that refers to another set of meanings through phases of enrichment and progressive development uh this can uh, you know this can i mean you can take this uh, this statement from various directions you can think of the translation of a text say uh, uh of a of a single text uh diachronically in history that is through the different periods in history and how the text gains or how the or what it loses is also gains in other contexts so there is this so there is you have a kind of an enrichment you have layers added to it maybe layers also taken out from it but uh, uh, uh this is uh, you know it's it's worth it's a it's a there is a kind of a, a movement forward perhaps um 
this is uh, and again you have in the same context maybe you can think of uh, um well yes and also uh, you can also think of a translation in the, we, we know this that it leads to the, the afterlife of a text you know sometimes the afterlife is not happy as well but uh, the afterlife of a text might mean that it can lead to other kinds of texts it can lead to other other kinds of translations uh, and so on and so forth so uh, then i will just end with a few texts on translation and uh, this is um, this is from the modernist period and uh, and uh, the first person I, i'm taking is shudhindranath dotto uh, the, the eminent poet and uh, shudhendra you know poets from the mid 20s of the 20th century tried to come out from the dominant presence of tagore to find new means of expression as they grappled with the times the aftermath of the war the freedom struggle the economic depression and the resulting instability uh, shudhendra dot in an essay entitled emancipation of poetry emphasized the need for an open ended process of reception he stated that the ground for creating poetry was not as fertile as before and so the poet should go out into the world and gather seeds that could germinate into poetry journals of poetry focusing on translation uh where uh, came out uh, uh, in uh, in those times and they changed the scene of modern poetry to a greater extent and uh, i will take up another another uh, small uh, comment because this is something that i really like and uh, dotto also talked about uh, uh, he used a complex symbol to describe his status as a translator although his translations could never reach the perfection of the source language poem he felt he could achieve the status of ekalavya you know so he brings in the story of ekalavya he thinks of himself the translator as ekalavya and so it was the colonizers history that made that to use the phrase of as the, the image of ekalavya for the translator and it seemed that there was more pride than humility in this particular image uh this is important as we think of uh the post colonial context of translation and the things that are usually stated regarding the colonizers position i mean the colon the position of the colonizers sorry uh and then i will move on quickly to buddhadev bosch and this will be my last reference uh, then uh, he also a poet uh, both buddhadev bosch and shudhindranath dot were responsible for bringing in modernism uh, in the context of poetry uh, in bengal so speaking on the act of translation with reference to shudhindranath dot's translations buddhadev bosch stated that translational activity implied training in discipline and self restraint it also brought in what he called a atma shuddhi or purification of the self in other words labor undertaken for the sake of poetry in a detached manner as a kind of sadhana or a single minded austere striving led to purification uh, this is important because it talks about the rigor of translation uh, you know and uh, it it talks about the it talks about how it is you know this is so it's not not just a question of even if one is talking of the fluidity of the text etc etc one cannot really uh, this is i mean that's a different matter altogether but in order to uh, in order to translate one has to enter into a state of deep reading i think spivak talks about this she talks she says that you know when you, only when you are translating you are entering a, a the kind of deep reading that you would never otherwise have entered into and also that you know this deep reading makes you um, uh, makes you uh, makes the makes the text your own 
so you have uh, you have a hold uh, over the uh, you have a you know you, you make the text your own so that you can engage with it uh, as you translate this is important and uh, to go back to buddhadev bose again with reference to his translation of kalidas's meghadutam he wrote that the ancient literary tradition manifested itself as a vital part of the modern because of an uninterrupted history of translations of ancient texts so you have tradition as a part of the modern because of the tradition of translations an uninterrupted history of translations of ancient texts translated texts while being discrete units were also a part of larger systems contributing to an extent to give shape to contemporary texts and or investing them with a certain depth and perspective and uh, so with that uh, this, this is i mean there are several strands i wanted to weave in strands that are you know theoretical with strands that are practical also but what i wish to state is that eventually the translator in an intercultural context is a mediator whose task is to create an intermediary zone where cultures can communicate enrich one another and move forward in the form of a growing network thank you very much for your patient uh, here and thank you so much yes thank you so much uh, that was indeed it was indeed a uh, uh, presentation which uh, we learned a lot from and uh, this uh, the very systematic manner you presented it i would now request uh, sarbani uh, who is the research associate of our center of excellence to uh, call for questions if there are any or uh, just go ahead with the rest okay ma'am Uh, good evening ma'am uh, and good evening to all of you to the participants i would now open the floor for any questions or any uh, comments that you have on uh, shubha ma'am's uh, lecture today feel free to post your questions or you may directly even uh, show yourself on the screen let's wait for uh, them to post questions ma'am yeah sure till that, yeah. Uh, till that time i really enjoyed yes, your uh, talk uh, and, thank you uh, at the beginning of the lecture you said that translation has not gained traction so much in india as it has gained in the rest of the world so why do you think it's such a case with india and uh, if possible uh, if you could suggest some steps that can help improve this condition yeah and i was talking in a very uh, very traditional fashion in the sense that you know if i if i ask somebody to translate a text translators you know they would at once come up with the question and who will publish the translation now so we don't really have we have not been able to create a market for translations despite the fact that there is so much need for translations of all kinds of texts and uh, and that i think that needs to be addressed from various directions i mean centers like yours could really help i mean in the sense that publishers need to uh, need to realize that there is a market you know, there is a demand for translations all kinds of translations and also uh, so it it has but i think this is the it, it has the, the you know the situation has improved a great deal and it looks positive i mean it looks as if translation does have a future and probably a great future and all and again you know different kinds of translation although one is I'm, i was just thinking of text but maybe one has one finds um, I, i mean one that there are possibilities to work in other contexts you know where one is translating in different companies and different i don't know in different sections and different public sector units so there is this 
constant demand for translators, interpreters. Interpretation is a part of the translation, and, and so on and so forth. That seems quite encouraging on your part. Um, the uh, that it's growing, the market is growing, but uh, I, mean, I think we need to try harder. Meanwhile, we have a question from Aditya Nayak, uh, and uh, he says hello. He asks you, what is the main difficulty of translating a work of high literary merit, and what qualities and skills are expected from a literary translator? Yeah, that's a very difficult question. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it, it depends on the kind of uh, text that you are choosing. I mean, whether it's poetry, whether it's uh, fiction, whether it's uh, drama, and uh, each has its. I mean, each has its problems. Each has its issues, and uh, maybe what is the the main uh, the uh, the what is the main difficult the main difficult is perhaps is getting the right tone getting the you know that will bring about the a similar experience that you had while reading the original possibly and uh, high literary merit what qualities and skills yes i think uh, you know a desire a passion <laughs> A desire to translate, a passion to translate. I think that's uh, because that that also brings in a lot of rigor. That also brings in. You know, you go on attempting. You you go on trying to translate. Uh, I remember uh, this is a uh, uh, Bose. He translated Baudelaire's uh, Le Fleur de Mal, and there were a lot of. And uh, well, the people said, well, it's it's not. I mean, it's uh, it's it does not. Uh, I mean, well, he, he, there, there was, it, it's not, it, it's not Baudelaire really, because the language was not really ready at that point of time to encompass the language of Baudelaire. The, I mean, Bangla at that point of time was not at a stage where it could encompass the whole uh, gamut of experiences that uh, Baudelaire was trying to bring to poetry. So it it is it has a kind of romantic structure, but there is a modern poet recently, a very important modern poet, Joy Goswami. Recently, he talked about he talked about the fact that uh, you know it was Budhudev Bose's life as translator that he was looking up to, and the fact that you know he translated all those poems and probably he did not get uh, the right word, but he would wait and wait and wait, and all of a sudden perhaps. He would, after many days, probably he would all of a sudden get a certain word. So it was to keep hoping, uh, to keep uh, keeping oneself open, and uh, for, for uh, and and also uh, you know constantly being at it. I mean, this kind of uh, dedication uh, is, he said, was what made Buddha Bosch's translation of Le Plaisir one of the greatest texts of translation in Bangla. Uh, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, really. I hope, Aditya, that answers your question. I seriously felt it, it did. Uh, he combines rigor and discipline, as you said, Buddha Dev Bosch. And he, um, I could feel as if it links it to, with a higher level of spirituality, which can be gained because you keep on waiting to receive the correct word. And you do not, you do not actually know when it will come to you. It's almost as a... As a for as as doing something which is first hand, it's as as good as a creative exercise, yeah. which you're doing, uh, like uh, for for primarily, as right as it's uh, as important as writing a primary text. We have, ma'am, another question from Saswat Ponda, and he thanks you for the engaging talk. Uh, he also asks you, could you please elaborate on the breakthrough made by print in the field of translation? Uh, was it only in terms of the number of texts that got translated, especially because of technology that favored large scale production of tests? Yes, thank you very much for that question. Also, th I thank Aditya for that, for, for your very interesting question, important question. And uh, yes, this is, I think, no, the print I think brought uh, was, uh, I mean, was, uh, I mean, changed the field of translation to a great extent. Uh, it it uh, translation became more institutionalized. 
you know, after the advent of print. Uh, so there was these societies were set up. And uh, so this is, and you know, this, this whole question of uh, uh, the literal translation, the whole question of translating, I mean, the, the field also perhaps became slightly, uh, became narrower. You know, because you were not translating, you were not one was you were not translating um, different kinds of texts. You were translating it was again, quote unquote, the missionary kind of zeal. Missionary, I'm, I'm not referring to religion, but I'm referring to you know certain kinds of knowledge. Encyclopedias have to be translated, knowledge texts like physics, chemistry, geography, and institutionalizing, institutionalizing language, institutionalizing. Um, you know, bringing in uh, symmetries, bringing in all kinds of, uh, well, the, so, so there were, I mean, one has to really explore this in greater detail, but I think it was not simply a question of the number of texts. The number of texts did, did multiply, but they, they, they also, I mean, an institutionalization means a lot of things, you know, power structures come into the play. I mean, come more. I'm not saying that otherwise they're not there, but power structures become, become more defined. And also because you, you are told what you, are, what you will translate. And so if a, if a text wins a prize, it gets translated into many other, into, in, well, and so on and so forth. So, so uh, uh, there are uh, hierarchies that are established. So, the, uh, so there, there may be other positive uh, areas also as far as institutionalization is concerned, but there are these other factors too. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that question. That was a good question. Uh, I, I, have, I think I have another one from Shipra Gupta. Uh, she thanks you for the lecture and she asks you, would it be proper to have comparative literature as a part of translation studies or vice versa? Yes, I think translation studies uh, could be a part of comparative literature, but both can exist separately also. But uh, vice versa, no, because comparative literature is not, although Susan Basson thinks a thought at one point of time, but she doesn't think so anymore. I mean, she has, she has uh, talked about this. She says that in at one stage, she thought that uh, it would be translation studies, because in comparative literature, you're doing intercultural studies. But now it is translation studies where you are doing intercultural studies. So, uh, you know, so, you know, comparative literature will be, will, be, will be replaced by translation studies. That's not the case because comparative literature does other things as well. Uh, but it does a lot of things that are also, uh, you know, that are very similar to translation studies. But again, there are a few other things, for instance, there are interdisciplinarity, for instance. I didn't have the occasion to mention that, but interdisciplinarity is becoming more and more a part of translation studies. And interdisciplinary has always been a part of comparative literature. Uh, I mean, interdisciplinary in the sense that you have, you know, for instance, you have cultural studies, you have the cognitive sciences, you have anthropology, you have sociology, and translation can, will work or translation, they're all working with translation. So, yes, thank you again once more for your question. That was a nice answer, I guess. I have uh, one more question. Uh, actually, I have a comment and a question. You said uh, that uh, you quoted somebody in between your lecture that never look at dictionaries for translation uh, mm -hmm. because uh, these words are dead. <laughs> what do you exactly mean by that? Because I refer to the dictionary all the time. Yeah, we all do, actually. <laughs> We all do know what she meant was that you need, uh, you know, this is what she meant was that, you know, uh, your intuition. I mean, that's important. You also, because you may find a dictionary because uh, dictionaries supply you with words that are, um, that are, that are in a sense dead, you know, in that sense. So dead and not dead, but then in the sense that what she meant was that, you know, you, you know, you just write what what comes to your mind first, and if you are if you are translating, you will see that often you look at dictionaries, you look for words, and then finally, when you are trying to, to revise, find that you are original. The first the first time of what you had thought worked better than 
the, the other uh, instances. Mm, <laughs> that is that. also something <laughs> that, that, I, that I learned in several workshops that, you know, your first attempt is often the best attempt. But of course, you have to go back. I mean, to sort of polish it a little bit, to polish and it, to work on it again. Yeah, hello. May I, uh, may I ask a question? Please? Sure, sure, please. And and I'm sure for, that illuminating lecture, uh, we learned so much from it. No, uh, no, so you to elaborate on that fascinating parallel between uh, Ekalabya and the translator, which uh, uh, the other, uh, both established. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was. Yeah, I find that fascinating too. I mean, he, he just has a, a sentence or two. This is, it's it's actually um, Shudindanath Dutta. It's uh, Shudindanath Dutta who talks of the translator as the Ekalavya. That is, you know, Ekalavya, that, that is, uh, I think what he means is that uh, he says that I, I will never be able to, uh, to, to, you know, translate a text. I mean, I will never be able to reach the level of the original text, but then I will keep trying, I will keep practicing, and there will come a time when I will probably exceed the original, and I will do, do better perhaps than my guru. He doesn't say that, Akalavya doesn't say that, but you know, I will excel, not than, or you know, there's no comparison, but I will excel. And, but then, you know, uh, this is so that, that it's i think it's a it's a very potent metaphor you know that there is a kind of you know one is all because particularly he he translated a lot of high modernist poets like malarme like rambo no not rambo malarme and valeri very difficult poems too so probably as a, you know as a as a you know Probably, I mean, not probably, but you know, he's trying to say that even as a person from the colonized world, even if you have reservations about your, even if you have, not reservation, but even you have, if you have doubts about your capacities, capabilities, and you're constantly working, maybe you will reach a stage where you will excel. And, but it's a very, very potent kind of, not just potent, but it's also a very, um, very important metaphor, I think, that is that he's using. You know, I also feel that uh, people talk about uh, the different words that we have for translation. You know, for instance, Anubad, uh, what, uh, Tarjuma, etc., etc., and that we should look at those words and try to see how we are different, how our translation, our notion of translation is different from those in the Western world. But I think when we talk of translation, these concepts are all, all they're, they're all enmeshed together. Uh, what, what's important, what becomes important, I think, are some of the metaphors that are used. I think ekalavya is one such metaphor, you know, like cannibalization, uh, you know, used in the Brazilian context, the trans, and then, uh, well, Many other such uh, in the in the medieval context, there is uh, well, there, there are certain models, maybe not more, but anyway, there are there, there there may be certain other metaphors too, but that we need to work with in order to think of uh, in our approaches to translation. I don't know, uh, Jetin, if I've answered your question, but thank you for asking. He says thank you. No, no, no. Yeah. Thank you. Well, answer my question to my satisfaction. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for agreeing to give this lecture at your at our center. And I hope you'll remain associated with our center in future. And uh, actually, I'm honored to be a part of this. And th thank you for thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. I love talking about translation, and as you know, and so it's it's really a great honor for me. And thank you. I thank all of you once more. Thank, thank you, you madam. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and we will look forward to many more exchanges like this. And when things are normal, we would want that you should come to the center. And we would meet face and have interaction face to face. 
we have yeah. to learn a lot from you. Thank that you. would be lovely. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. I would love to go over. Thank you so much. Yes. And I also, this is a, and we, as you said, we are really going through bad times, very grim times. I wish all of you a very, very healthy uh, period ahead, you and all your relatives, friends, and uh, to those who are not well, I wish them speedy recovery. So all best wishes for the future. Uh, thank you, madam. And same from this side too your family and your near and dear ones. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Jatin, you, sir, uh, for being here. And so we, will, uh, so we had indeed a very uh, yeah, inspirational uh, talk and like many translation uh, research uh, scholars might have, uh, who had joined, might have uh, taken down wonderful notes from here and uh, extend that to their own personal work. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. I take leave now. Thank you. We will be in touch, madam. Yes, we, we will be in touch. Yes. Thank you.
स्टमक इनफेक्शन चेक मोर काली भी बांधी है चला ये बात की है ना कभी इधर बच्चों को जैसे बच्चों को आ रहे होंगे 